I'd like to call this board meeting to order. Can we get a roll call, sir? Mr. Ballard? Here. Mr. Demacchia? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Mr. Sturgill? Here. Mr. Williams? Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Yvonne's here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And we've already added you to the roll. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Some more room. We got too much letters passed. First, we have our recognition of visitors, and it seems like everybody up here has been here pretty consistent. So this is all one big part of the family anymore. But we do always want to welcome our ADC members that join us, and of course, our legal counsel with Miss Mallory. Thank you for being here. Um, we have our first hearing of the public. Marge Walker, 2955 Lexington. And then, as you know, I have already made comments about the time school starts. And they start at 720. Well, now, Ridgeville, next year, they're going to be starting at 830. Man, these kids, I don't know what they'll do with all that sleep. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> They must have seen some of the statistics that I have been looking up. And uh, somebody I had talked to said that they have to get up at 5.30 in the morning here, Lorraine, no. to go to school. I think Thank for you. kids to get up that early in the morning, even for adults, it's absolutely ridiculous. And when you're a teenager, you want to stay up late and play with your electrical gadgets. Uh, I hope that Lorraine can get on the bandwagon and start school at 8.30, 9 o'clock even better. Thank you. Love it. Love it. You're slacking, Jay. You're number two this time. I know. <laughs> Got to be quick, buddy. She was quick. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I'm Jay Pickering. I'm the president of Lorraine Education Association. And represent the teachers here in Lorraine. I'd like to speak a little about uh, the need to evaluate our CEO before the Academic Distress Commission gives him an up or down on his future here in Lorraine. I would like to address the Academic Distress Commission, but we don't know when they're meeting and it's, uh, it might even be more appropriate for me to address it there. But anyways, um, <clears throat> to do that, I'd like to describe to you how he has recently treated some of our teachers here. On April 10th, uh, several teachers received a letter indicating they were not going to be renewed for next year. Uh, they were called either down to the office or somebody arrived at their room at the end of the day on April 10th. And they were given this letter that says, notification of intention to recommend non-renewal. They were given no reasons for this recommendation. If they wanted to learn the reasons, they would have to follow the newly created policy by the, AD, uh, by the CEO, which for the first time we got a chance to see as well. Actually, I've passed this out to the, uh, uh, to the members here, and you can see it was adopted on April 10th, which was the day the teachers received this letter. It says, for those that don't have a copy, uh, it's a new policy giving authority and control of the chief executive officer as applied to non-renewal of limited teacher contracts. It is the intent of this policy to modify and supersede the policies and procedures established by the Board of Education, and it goes on to describe what this is. These teachers were not given any reason. Uh, I was not even contacted regarding this as to who they are. There could be more of them out there. I realize that today just thinking about it. They may not have contacted me. Uh, <clears throat> the evaluation process in Lorraine is not over with until actually tomorrow. So the, these folks have not gone through any evaluation. And you say, how could this happen? And I do have to admit that our teacher contract does allow for this to occur. 
We have a segment in there, a section which I'd never talk about, but unfortunately it's occurred and everybody knows about it, so I can talk about it. But if a teacher that is within two years of employment here in Lorraine, uh, is, well, we call them actually probationary employees, they can be non-renewed without going through the evaluation procedure or apparently by not even be given a reason. Uh, because at this point, this occurred almost three weeks ago, these teachers have not heard any reason given, have not been given a reason. They have asked for the reason, it has not been given to them. Uh, I can share with you that um, they are special ed teachers, all of them. The supervisor in two cases did not even know about it. And I saw this via text that he sent to the teachers asking what was going on because he wasn't aware they were gonna do it. One of the teacher's evaluators was not even aware of this, and that teacher was receiving skilled on her evaluations up until she received this letter. The real thing here is these folks had to go home to their families, and they had to explain to them that they will not have a job next year, they may not have health insurance, and they don't know why. All right, to make it even more cruel in my opinion, they are being forced to continue the evaluation procedure which is not being followed to determine their non-renewal. And to give these folks credit, they have been there nearly every day since then. As I said, they're special ed teachers, they have IEPs to finish, and for the good of the students, they have not just said, I give up. <clears throat> I personally would consider this egregious behavior. And you know what, I'm not the only one that thinks that way. Randall Sampson, the chairman of the Academic Distress Committee, also believes this is egregious behavior. I thought I'd see Randall here because he's attended a few meetings. I'm disappointed not to see him here. Um, I'm not sure he's aware of this situation, uh, but I, the reason I know that he believes this is because he made some comments at the Academic Distress Commission meeting on March 19th. Now, I believe he made these comments in relation to the idea that to justify the need of evaluating the CEO before the Academic Distress Commission gives an up or down to his future here. You can view these comments on YouTube. It is two minutes and 33, or two hours and 33 minutes into the YouTube. He is sitting right next to Dave Hardy, the CEO. And here's what he said. If we hire a teacher and arbitrarily gave that teacher up or down right now at the end of the school year and the teacher has to go home and speak to their family about that situation, that would be egregious. There is no way possible we can evaluate a teacher without a criteria and come in on a whim and create an evaluation system. That is exactly what occurred to these three teachers. Now I just wanted to make sure, I'm a science teacher and I'm not an English teacher, so I checked on the definition of egregious from Miriam Webster. And it says, um, the term egregious refers to actions or behaviors that are staggeringly bad or obviously wrong beyond any reasonable degree. The term is commonly used to describe conduct of a person. I would submit to you that the CEO is guilty of egregious activities. Now, I don't know about you, I'm a big believer in the golden rule. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I submit as evidence right here that Dave Hardy is telling us how he believes he can be treated, just like he is treating others. He doesn't need an evaluation system. He's a probationary employee here in Lorraine, just like those teachers. And I think there are a lot of reasons available. Uh, additionally, I think he has now given the Academic Distress Commission an example of egregious behavior, and if we want to keep a CEO here that, is, uh, that uh, is, performs egregious behaviors, the ADC now has that as evidence too. I, I don't believe he should be treated any better than he treats any other person. These folks, these teachers, are no less humans than he is. They have no fewer family members than he has. So. I, um, like I said, I'm disappointed Randall's not here. Maybe he'll watch this video, but I challenge Randall Sampson and the Academic Distress Committee to do the right thing and end this CEO's egregious behavior before more families are harmed. Thank you. Jay, I got a question. Sure. Jay, on both yep. of us. <laughs> were, were all the employees probationary that got the non renewal? Yes, <clears throat> right. They're two years or less. Okay, then. 
I, I'm, I'm assuming that that they went through, you know, their their, their processes. That I mean, did they get due process on everything? Or we, I've passed out the due pot process, the new one. <laughs> the new one? Well, yeah. I'm sorry. That I didn't read this yet. Oh yeah, it's a lot there, um, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> That's what they get to go through, and that doesn't provide them any relief. It simply says you get to, you get to talk to people about it. Um, we've looked at that. We have concerns, by the way. Our, our organization and our lawyers are looking at that policy. Um, and if you note in this policy, it is not just limited to these probationary employees. This is for any limited contract teacher in the district. Uh, state law says they have to be notified by June 1st if the district is intending to non-renew them. Yes. How many teachers did you say? There were several. I don't like to identify the number only because I have to keep them, you know, uh, anonymous. In other words, could we say more than five? Uh, no, I, I'll be honest. It's less than five. Less yeah. than five. But in my opinion, one of them is mm -hmm. more than enough. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So Otez doesn't apply here. Nope. How long have we had this policy? April 10th, 2019, a little less than three weeks ago. You don't have it, the CEO has it. I mean, it, it supersedes right. your ability to create policy. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> as we know. <laughs> hey, Jay, did you say that, uh, there, number one, I heard you say to your special ed teachers, yeah. but did you also say the special ed director was unaware? That is the supervisor, I should say. The right. most direct supervisor, I just saw the text the teacher showed me and said, look, you know, he didn't even know this was occurring. I mean, isn't he the one who should be evaluating these teachers or well, uh, they have, a, have some kind of input in whether they should be brought back or not? I would think. <laughs> it's usually the normal process, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. And I'm just going to pitch a question to our ADC members who are here. Mm -hmm. Were you guys aware that any of these policies were being changed? I was informed there was a couple non-renewals. Okay. Um, I didn't know the extent or the details of the situation. Um, I am shocked to hear that the teacher received a skilled on her evaluation and also received this non-renewal. That doesn't make much sense. Okay. So definitely a c concern to be looked into. Yeah, I agree. And there were other policy changes that have been made since the fall that have been made by the CEO that did not go through us or obviously you guys as well. So House Bill 70 doesn't? give you guys the authority to approve those policies you just we can change policy and that's all that apparently yes interesting okay that it thank thanks, you folks. sir appreciate thanks. it any other from the public please uh bambi dillon uh, okay i have so many emotions it keeps me up at night with things going in my head because I've volunteered so much here for Lorraine City Schools and for levy committees and everything else and I understand because our schools are in such shambles I can understand why the school board will not put a levy on if they get no answers and so this is my question to you since the state created this mess and since you the school board will not put a school levy on are we going to ask the state board of education to give us that three point some million dollars that we're not going to get because of the mess they created Is that i'd a, like to know you, that you, so. yes i want to know i <laughs> want you to go and ask them for mm -hmm. the money that we will not get because we will not be putting on a school levy because of their mess. And because of their mess now, it's going to make a deficit for Josh to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to affect the children. Am I not correct? So in the most honest answer to that question is there is a lot of damage that House Bill 70 has caused our district. I know that. And I think there will be a time that we will have to stop and consider what we do moving forward to the damage that's been done by the state to our district. Okay. And if we're able to make any type, we will have to then talk to legal because I'm sure she's giving me the sharp eye from this side there. <laughs> but at that well, point, we will reevaluate and see if there's anything within our Okay, but our, see, Josh our only has till July to apply, correct? Do you have to 
to put a levy on in well, November. The absolute, the absolute deadline is the beginning of August. August 30th. And we've got to have two meetings in order to pass two. Right. Yeah. And then the, the end of the money will be this year, At the right? Latest, yeah. Depending on how close. Well, I need space between those two meetings in order to get the first one has given me the ability to have the auditor's office um, do the, their uh, calculation. And then it gives me the ability then to take it back, have them certify that they have, you guys have passed it. And then the next piece or next resolution gives me the ability then to submit it to the Board of Elections. Okay. So it probably comfortably, I would want at least a week in between those meetings. So, I mean, worst case scenario, you're probably talking 10 days at an absolute minimum just to give the county auditor's office enough time to certify. Okay. Now, uh, the current levy we have. The money will end at the end of this year. January or 1st. Or do you is gone. get, or is it behind? January 1st is gone. Okay. This is the last year of collection. For the levy. Mm -hmm. And you were, if we were to put it on, what were you going to ask for? Or what do you think they would ask for? Three it's point just, something? It's just the renewal, and, yeah. Which is it's what? 3.1 3 3 million. 1 million. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I sure hope that you guys ask the state where we're supposed to get the money at since they created this mess. That's fair. You know, they can't run the government. I don't know why they think they can run a school system. <laughs> and then, also, it makes me upset when I go to these meetings. A few times Mr. Hardy asked me to come to these meetings, and he meets with senior, uh, junior and senior uh, students. And one day, it was very upsetting for me because they were, I'm not sure where they were at. They were uh, at another location, another school system. And somebody said to them, oh, where are you from? Learning City Schools, oh, well, that's too bad. Mm. Yes. You know, the children there, they felt really bad mm -hmm. because of all this negative stuff in the paper. It makes them feel like they're not uh, smart, <laughs> you know, that they're, because it's, we're a failing system, this and that. You can't blame the teachers for a failing system. They've gone to school, they've got their college degree, they are not allowed to teach like the teachers in years ago taught all of us. They have to teach the kids how to pass tests and nothing about reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. So with that being said, I'm a member of the Lorraine Alumni Association and last week we had a meeting because uh, we honor uh, distinguished alumni. Now last year our first class we had 12 and this year we decided we're going to try to open it up to 20 because we're so behind because nobody ever started this. Well, I wanted to like hopefully address these students that feel bad about you know this whole situation and what people are saying about our school system because uh, in uh, we have a gentleman uh, that is, well, I'm sorry, a woman. Her name is, last name is Bartik. She's a VP of Mission in Integration at Mercy Hospital. We have Melissa Driscoll. She's a singer and actress. We have Tim and Terry Kudrowski, who's an entrepreneur, have their own successful bakery department. Uh, there was a, um, a Monica Link. She's Chief Operating Officer of Magruder Hospital. Director of Pharmacy at Magruder Hospital. Uh, we have uh, Jason Molina. He's a musician, a singer, and a songwriter. We have Mr. Pecan, who served in the Marines and is retired from Lorraine City Schools and was a very uh, respected and great educator here for our schools. Uh, we have, uh, let me see, uh, Dr. Costin who's a cataract surgeon, very successful. We have Marie de Luciano, who has, they started their own business and it's global wide and is very successful. We also have uh, Craig Fulton, who was our mayor and now he's executive vice president at Community College, I believe. We also have, um, a gentleman that was a graduate of Yale and University of Michigan. He was an executive vice president of United Health Group and a corporate chief information officer. We have a graduate that is now executive director of the Cleveland Metropolitan Park Zoo. 
we have a gentleman that was CEO and president of BP America. Uh, we also have a gentleman that was, um, had a master's of science in strategic studies for the U.S. Army for a 25 year career and he was located in Italy and oversaw the families and the government civilians there and he served in Iraq. Now, these kids here need to realize that they can be just as successful as these people and I'm tired of the negative publicity for our children. We need to have that stopped. We have inside problems because of the organizational chart that the governor set up for a school system. That's ridiculous because the corporate businesses don't even have that type of setup where a CEO has all the, prob uh, um, all the authority. And I'm not just saying uh, Mr. Hardy. Anybody, he could leave and somebody else could come back. Who do you, be, do you think they might be the same kind of person? because they have that kind of power. And until you guys do get the HB 70 done, ch you have to change the organizational chart where it's a CEO and directors and they all have an input and not one person has authority. So maybe I'll sleep tonight. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, Barbie Washington, Riverside Drive. I don't know if you can answer a question, but um, Mr. Pickering uh, addressed the special needs teachers. I was just wondering, are any of them the new TFA teachers, perhaps the one that doesn't even know or didn't know what an IEP was when they began this year? Is uh, Mr. Pickering still here? Yeah. He could probably answer that better. I can say no, only because I know the location of the Teach for America teacher was not in that building. So, no, Teach for America teacher is still here. Um, then my, uh, my question is, um, myself, uh, as Barbie Washington, Titan underscore mom underscore on Twitter, and then It Takes a Village um, on Twitter, was blocked by Randall Sampson. And... Um, as the Lorraine ADC. My question to the two ADC members here, um, I would like to know, is that your account? Um, and uh, it's under my impression that it is illegal for a public official to block. Um, it is not our account. We were, I don't know if you want me to speak for... No, that's, that's fine. Steve and I talked, and um, neither one of us had anything to do with that Twitter account. In fact, we sent an email out. He sent the first email, and I was as concerned as he was. And um, we know that two other commissioners said that they did not know anything about the Twitter account, and we have not heard back from Mr. Sampson. Yeah, it was not put together by us. Is there... Uh, it's, um, it's a Lorraine ADC account and it is using the logo that is owned by Lorraine City Schools to operate. Hmm. I also reported this to Twitter directly as it not being my account and it's representing a person or a group that I belong to. And, and my thing was that we have a difficult time as ADC to decide when we're gonna meet the direction of the district. I don't personally want an account that represents the ADC because that doesn't represent necessarily what I feel. So I've looked at some of the tweets. I don't follow the ADC account, but I've checked it, and there's certain things that have been listed on there that I personally would not have posted. They're not derogatory or, or horrible or anything, but they're just not my personal philosophy in terms of some verbiage and there is some other specific tweets of things. So I just don't like the fact that it implies, as your question implies, that it represents myself, it our represents Diane, and, as a whole. and then we were never consulted on whether or not that was going to be done. We never said no, yes, or even had a discussion about it. Um, especially with it being um, against the law, and then there could be consequences. There was a senator that, was, uh, that just paid $20,000 for blocking uh, a citizen. Mm -hmm. Um, meeting, is there a meeting date set? Has an evaluation been done? I don't know if we're able to say 
publicly when the meeting is. There's been a date, I believe, in June that has been a tentative June fifth date yeah. is the last time that we've we finalized. So it has not been made <clears throat> public yet as of now, I should say. But yes, June fifth is the date. Okay, and no evaluation at this time. Thanks. And Barbie, uh, just to your point, not, I'm definitely not going to put Ms. Santiago on a mm -hmm. you know spot, but I do believe you're accurate in your evaluation of uh, a public official. If they are utilizing a social media account for public business, then I do not believe it is legal for them to block a constituent uh, from get, getting access to that individual. But that might be something you want to maybe get a legal opinion about. Anything further from the public? Nothing further? Okay, I need a motion to approve the minutes from the April 9th and the April 13th uh, meeting. So moved. Support. Mr. Sergio? Yes. Mr. Demacchia? Yes. Mr. Ballard? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Do you have anything today under old business? Uh, I do. I had, I had asked Josh, and I don't know if, you, if you're ready for that, but I had asked him to, to go back and look at the, the numbers on the buildings and, 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 and divide it by elementary, junior high, and high school. Because I'm, I'm still thinking that, that we have quite a few people leaving the district. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm watching to see if it's... If it's dropped, do you have any information on? I don't yet. Um, I did send it over to uh, Emis, who just so happens to be, came from Power School, it's Barb Bowen. Um, she is pulling the numbers, uh, and I asked her maybe about a half an hour before the meeting, where do we stand on that? She hadn't uh, pulled it. She's trying to, to make sure Power School aligns with Emis. I had asked for the dates from, uh, and, and it, it I asked for from June 1st until present, mm -hmm. and I, I could have asked for probably August when school started until until now. But I figured people probably le leave. There's, and, there's and, some and, big and dates in the summer. In all fairness, I asked how much we gained. Also, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. if we gained if we gained some, so I just wanted to I wanted to see those numbers because I just have I, I still have that feeling that that we've got a lot more leaving than we know about. Mm -hmm. And that, that too affects uh, uh, every hundred really. Agreed. Every hundred affects what, $600,000? Roughly. Yeah. Well, I so, thought I'd heard a number that we lost 19 within a two week period or something just very recently. Um, so to your point, I do hear there's still, a, and this is in the final quarter, mm -hmm. I do hear that there's a big number still. Well, then, then again, the state should have these numbers by now, so. Yeah, that's why I don't understand the difficulty see if they coincide. Getting, getting that information. Is that it, Bill? Yeah, so we hopefully we'll have it by next board meeting. I'll get it to you sooner than that. I'll probably have it within the next couple of days. I was a little shocked I didn't have it now. Yeah. But I think you got it to me Friday, and I sent it over to her either Thursday or Friday. Yeah, I sent it over to her immediately. It was it, it was, it was kind of short notice, you know. Mm -hmm. So I uh, but, as but soon I, as I, I have them, I'll get them. I was to you still guys. thinking about it. it. Was on my mind, so I did it while it was on my mind. <laughs> Anyone else have any old business? Yes. yes. Um, I was very pleased, and I wish to thank uh, Mr. Ballard and Mr. Demacia for that in-service workshop that we had on Saturday. It was phenomenal. I wish all of us as the board, all just the all the people that come to the monthly meeting with the superintendent, I wish they had been there because it was very informative. It was excellent. It was well done. And I'd just like to thank them for doing such an excellent job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a few things that uh, I want to uh, talk in old business, but uh, you know, to your point, Ms. Dillon, uh, you know, I'm going to point out a couple things that are negative, but uh, uh, you know, House Bill 70 has brought 
much of this negativity um, and the people that it brought to this district. And unfortunately, you know, Lorraine City Schools has always dealt with a negative perception because we are the largest school district in the county. We are an urban school district and, you know, school districts on the outside of here, they, they have no idea what goes on in our classroom. They have no idea the great programs that happen and, and the great students that we graduate that go on to do great things. And that was just a small list. Right. I mean, y y there are people still in this community that are grown adults and, and that list is enormous of how many great graduates have gone on to do fantastic things and, and we're going to continue to graduate those kids and, and all those things have always we've always had great things in the school district uh, you know the problem is the state evaluation is a flawed evaluation of how they evaluate pu public education through some standardized test and that is an issue in itself uh, the other issue is the funding of public education that's a major issue so those things you can ask any common citizen in this community what does a failing school district mean exactly and many people don't even understand what that means they understand it because they read it in the newspapers they see it the state of ohio says you're a failing school district because your kids couldn't pass a standardized test our kids couldn't pass a standardized test because we've done nothing to help them with the barriers they face before they come to our doorsteps to take that test so they're not interested in taking that test not to mention the many students that we have that are english uh, second language learners that speak spanish they have to take that same standardized test. You know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. But, uh, you know, speaking of Spanish-speaking students, I don't know if you guys saw the two uh, very unfortunate news reports that were on Fox 8 uh, News this mm -hmm. past week. Uh, but apparently there was a situation in one of our middle schools where a special needs kid, a paraplegic, uh, had fallen out of his wheelchair. And the... Uh, what, what ensued after that was number one alarming and it just turned my stomach uh, from what I heard had happened uh, from the people that were in that classroom, the, mm -hmm. the devastation to those other students in that classroom about how that child was mistreated. Um, and then what really bothered me to find out that the school district did absolutely nothing. Uh, they did not investigate that situation until Melissa Reed from Fox 8 started pounding on their doors asking questions about the situation. Then they decided to do something about it, and that is unacceptable. And these are the things that when you have unqualified, incompetent people in positions to make decisions, these are the things that happen. And what is even more alarming is that administration in that building directed that teacher not to inform that family of exactly what that aide had done in that situation. Intentionally deceived that family so they wouldn't know. Again, hiding the reality that something should have been done with that employee of this school district and they neglected to do their job. And they put another child's safety at risk. Unacceptable and we've been seeing it for the last year and a half. At some point in time, somebody has to do something. So if you didn't get a chance to see that, you might want to look it up. I mean, it was extremely disturbing to see that. Um, and speaking of state standardized tests, and you guys can help me out more than, uh, the state standardized test, in, in my opinion, it might be the most important piece of testing that any of our students have or any student in the state of Iowa has. And in my experience with building administrators, I'm, I'm a little alarmed that during the state testing week here at Lorraine High School, our executive director took a five-day vacation and wasn't even around during state standardized tests. Is this not the most important assessment that our students have to take? And isn't he the most important individual in a building to make sure that this testing goes smoothly, to make sure everything is the way it should be, classrooms are prepared, students are there? I, I just, when I heard that, I was uh, alarmed that I, I don't think any school district would allow their building principal to leave during state testing. And again, I, I will defer to you because I, I'm not. I can say it's the most critical week of the year and it's all hands on deck. Yeah. Everybody's involved to make sure that you get through testing smoothly and it's, it's quite an enormous task to get through it. And, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, that would be yeah. my advice to not take a time off. Apparently it wasn't important to that individual. Um, that's the negative I have. I really want to talk about the positive. I had a great <laughs> opportunity and I want to thank Joe Bach. 
because he had set this up with WEOL and Andy and Matt over there. And just the other day, you know, uh, I sat in Mark's seat for a second and uh, had an opportunity to discuss some of the, the great things that are going on. And again, I, I have to reiterate that these great things in the school district have been going on for years. You know, our robotics program, uh, again, just to talk about them, and I know they came here and they, and they come at, you know, the work that is put into that program that those instructors put in at Longfellow is certainly unbelievable. And, uh, you know, again, our Long Longfellow robotics team was a world qualifier, uh, you know, and I have to give a lot of credit to Denise Farney and Ryan Dickinson and Deb Hansen that run that program. They do a phenomenal job. Um, you know, the other thing that uh, I saw in one of the newspapers was the uh, American Sign Language class and, and uh, teacher Meredith Maddie Percival. Uh, it's in third year of his program and I was floored when I found out that this year more than 160 students in ninth through 12th grade wanted to take this class and on any given time there are at least 70 kids on a waiting list to take this sign language class. And, what a fantastic opportunity and, and you know if you see some of the comments from some of those students that take it and I was impressed I, I got an opportunity to, to watch them do it at a couple basketball games wow how, I mean they they have learned how to do lessons not just vocabulary but the Pledge of Allegiance the National Anthem and even the Bill of Rights uh, they have learned to sign movies and shows uh, I mean just absolutely unbelievable because you know a lot of times we focus on Spanish and French and you know some of these main languages that we always teach and uh, you know we forget about uh, classes like this so I, I got to give a lot of credit to Ms. Percival and in, in that class and, and the great thing that they have done um, also uh, they had their second annual senior day service uh, they had about an estimated 400 Lorraine High seniors that participated in this year. They volunteered at uh, more than 25 sites in Lorraine and Elyria. Um, they helped uh, organizations out like El Centro, Goodwill, Head Start, Friendship Animal, Animal Protective League, Salvation Army, uh, Lorraine County Community Action Agency. So, you know, having 400 students come out of, you know, Lorraine to go out and help the community and help these organizations and volunteer their time. Uh, and I know they had a, a great experience doing that. Uh, the other thing, uh, and bear with me because, you know, sometimes we don't get an opportunity to do this, but, uh, you know, I was amazed at, number one, I'm always amazed listening to them, but the Lorraine High Marching Band, they are a fantastic band that does a brilliant job under that leadership. And, uh, you know, Mr. Timothy Civic uh, has done a fantastic job over the years. Uh, they have made several major appearances that are worth noting. Uh, they appeared at the Magnificent Mile Lights Parade in Chicago, Illinois, America's Thanksgiving Parade in Detroit, Michigan, the Puerto Rican People's Day Parade in uh, Chicago, Illinois, National mm -hmm. Cherry Blossom Festival Parade in Washington, D.C., and they will also be performing in the Citru Citrus Bowl Parade in Orlando, For Florida. So uh, you got to be pretty dang good to be able to make all those appearances and be invited to those things. I mean, you just don't uh, show up, you know, the, you know, there are invitations to those things. Um, you know, and the last thing is, uh, you know, we always talk about, you know, our, these programs that happen uh, throughout the district, but, you know, notably it's always the sports that, you know, gets all the, you know, accolades and everybody talks about because, you know, most people like sports. Um, this past basketball season, uh, you know, obviously we, we experienced some great success with our boys basketball program. They went 23-2 and two and they again won the Lake Erie League uh, by going 12-0 and 0 in the conference. Isn't this the fourth time in five years to do that, which is extremely challenging to do. And, of course, uh, Devon Grant won Lorain County Mr. Basketball, which is uh, spectacular, and he's committed to Miami University. But uh, also uh, I want to talk about the girls basketball, and if he could, uh, Coach Angel Sanders. Sanchez is here. Could you stand up? And I just give him a round of applause. The 7th uh, and 8th grade girls basketball team uh, had an unbelievable season. The 7th grade went 13-3 and three, uh, and the 8th grade went 17-0 and 0 under the leadership of, of Coach uh, Sanchez and others. Uh, they both won the Lake Erie League uh, championships. Uh, and anybody that's ever coached, uh, you know, coaching is a thankless job and it's uh, very time consuming and difficult to do. So I commend Coach Sanchez and the rest of the staff for your fantastic season. Congratulations to you and all the girls. Great job.
That's it. Man. I think that's plenty. That's all I got. That's it. <laughs> I got another one. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say that we may not have the power to create policy, but we can commend all of the students and the teachers and give them the flowers that they need right now. I have one more thing to say. As the House Bill 70, and we know we're trying to do something about that, if you had been there Saturday, you could have he heard the uh, state senators, the congressmen, um, all types of legislatures. They were talking about how that they could return the power back to the Board of Education. But there's so many steps and there's so many blocks to do that, that when we were asking the question, it might take until the end of 2019 or until maybe the spring of 2020. Am I right about that? If anybody knows any difference, but that was sort of the information that I got. Well, it, what, there, was that right? There, well, there's uh, Why? quite a few. It really, it, it is dependent upon uh, yeah. you know, our elected legislators in Columbus, and there are a couple different routes that they could possibly take. One, one is putting uh, some kind of an amendment or repeal or some kind of language in the budget itself uh, with an emergency attachment, which would make it as soon as the governor signed it, that change would happen immediately. Uh, but again, uh, you know, they're actually taking the appropriate route with this bill, unlike they did with House Bill 70. And well, there's three bills uh, mm -hmm. right now currently uh, in legislation, and, and they're going through the readings and the testimony for those bills. And uh, it is extremely challenging. So, you know, it's on their backs. But uh, hopefully, uh, many of those legislators do the right thing. I know that uh, Lorraine has been heard in Columbus. Uh, you know, I know Mark has been in a lot of those conversations, as well as uh, Mayor Rittenauer and uh, some of the other folks uh, from around this local leadership. So they, we're certainly pushing, but it is on the legislators, and, and it could happen a couple different ways. I mean, there's really no definitive timeline. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen uh, next year. We don't know, uh, but uh, again, that is on, on in legislation, and, and they're pushing it, and they just got to get the right votes. and. Uh, you know, Mr. Bell, I, I, I didn't want to say the obvious at that meeting, and the obvious was that the state superintendent can remove us. Correct. Okay, so no, no one talked about that, but. Uh, but he's not going to do the right thing. He's proven up to this point that he's uh, not he, going to do what we consider the right thing. But what I was trying to get at the point, while they were really trying to get there, Correct. and there's so many complicated steps, mm. isn't his contract? finish by June the 11th and he gets a renewal that's up to the from the state that's up to the commission yeah, they've actually got to, they've got to agree on a meeting date first <laughs> that's what I'm saying so we while start. we're talking about this and trying to do something he's already in again and if he is the uh, intelligent man that we think he is if he can do all of this and get us all um, upset and our teachers, uh, as they say, so frightened. And um, the whole city uh, in some type of quandary. Um, then if I were him, I'm just talking from the top of my head, then I would see for a multiple contract. I would not ask for a one-year contract from the state. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? I do, but that completely would not be our problem. That would be the state's problem. They get to write that check. But, but, but yeah. I, this is what I'm saying. As all that change is happening and they're trying to give us our power back, mm -hmm. that can occur. With the, <laughs> with the, with the damage he's done in this district, he, if he wanted to do the right thing, he wouldn't even ask for a one-year contract. He'd just move on his way. Now, I'm talking about reality, though. Uh, that is reality. And, and, so. and, my, and my point is, I think the legislators have 
first of all, the state superintendent has agreed that Hospital 70 is not working properly and that it's been a disaster, basically. He says it can't work in a community. Um, the legislators have realized what they've done wrong and they know that they now have to fix this. So at this point, we've just got to let the process take care of itself. But things are turning around and they are trying to fix and right their wrongs. Okay. Now, if we get another, uh, it wouldn't be a CEO, it would be a superintendent. Are we going to give him the same measurement that we gave this CEO and tell him within two to three years if he has not made the change? I think we're getting, I think we're getting ahead of our we, skis at this point. I, I think we have to, as a community, mm -hmm. come up with a plan on how do we succeed after House Bill 70. Everything wasn't done right prior to us going in, and we now have to fix that as a collective on how we fix our district going forward. And I don't think that has been created yet. No. But that's something that we as but it's Lorraine something citizens, to think about. 100%, mm -hmm. and we have to do it collectively as a community with some of the ADC members, all of the ADC members, with our um, legal officials downtown Lorraine, with the businesses of Lorraine, mm -hmm. and with the parents who are most important with their children. So we have to come up with that program moving forward. Whether there's a CEO or not, that conversation needs to be had. Yes. So it's a community effort. That's Mark's opinion. Hmm. That it? All right. <laughs> we have any recommendations from the treasurer? I have none. Do you have any recommendations from the CEO? I have none. Your job's been pretty easy this week, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a second hearing of the public. <laughs> Wow. <coughs> Hi, my name is Kathleen Lilly. I'm president of C120, and I represent 150 people that work in this school district, and the majority of them live in this community. And Tony, you really made me angry with your um, blaming a personal attendant for something. I'd like to know where you got your information, because that personal attendant did nothing wrong. Mm. He followed procedure. Everything was completely done. The parent knew that afternoon what happened mm -mm. yes no. absolutely yes now they're going back because there's been another person talking to them it's public comments without all the information that makes Lorraine city schools look bad right. and that's that's wrong we need to get it all there is a procedure going there will be an investigation i'm not supporting the administration but i support i support the the process to find out the truth. So, Thank you. Mrs. Lloyd, did you did you see the video? Yeah. Pardon me. <laughs> did you see the video? I did. I did see that, and I did hear, and I do know why that child was laying on the floor. But that's waiting oh. for the other people to get. This was in a special needs classroom. Those kids were very upset, mm -hmm. and they're quoting a seventh grade special needs per child who is very upset that sees something happening. When everybody's crowding around, you're supposed to clear stuff back to make sure that child is not hurt before you try to move them. And that's what is happening. Mm. So let's just let everything, this person did nothing wrong. Except for yell at a special needs kid as he's laying on the ground. Yeah, he had, his comments weren't, I mean, they, they weren't what I would say was, would be a pre he didn't look like he was helping the situation is what I'm saying I mean and, but I'm, I'm okay he with was in shock. I'm mm. pretty much in shock because the, what was happening right. is something that happened every single school day yeah. this year but I mean I, I'm okay with, the, with letting you know due process, due process yes. yeah but to publicly say something before that happens just make it made me very angry yes it took a week for the school district to do anything about it yeah this a week if I can, I think your point was, it's fair to criticize that maybe it wasn't handled correctly in the administration, mm -hmm. but what we're doing, and we all do it, is if we spread all this and talk about it and say, oh, look what happened, and we got a, a mm -hmm. well, we're making this exactly what Bambi talked about, and publicly saying, you know, look what goes on in Wayne City Schools. Tony, mm -hmm. criticizing a little bit is, this ain't a forum to do that either because it just 
builds on that. It makes it sound like we got people in the schools when if you investigated the facts, there's another side to every story. In this case, that person thought they were doing the right thing. They weren't out to harm. They were, these are good people that work there. So I guess her point was she's trying to defend after talking to the person, interviewing, getting all the facts. It was an unfortunate situation, but when you put it out in the media and you, and you have the cell phones in the classroom and they start talking about it, it makes it look bad, and we just don't want you to make it look bad too. Yes. Lorraine City Schools people are good people, they work hard, and there's very few of them that are going to intentionally do something wrong with children. So I guess that was only her only point. Yeah. And, I, and I'll say it was brought to my attention via the, the news. And then it I did see the, bad. It yeah, really and then does. I did see the, the, the parents that were interviewed on the second day. And as and I and I and I did make a statement that I, I'm interested in the investigation happening swiftly so we can get to the bottom of whatever's sure, going on. And I think that is a fair due process. But if you look into that, you'll find there is complications yeah, into and, that too. And, and I don't want yeah. any preconceived before it happened, but I think the okay. the process should take its course. And thank you for that. I appreciate it from both of you. Courtney Nazario, West 11th Street. I have a couple things. To go back to that, to say that he did it every day, right in the incident report, said it was the first time Jacob attempted to stand. She said that he was in shock because it had happened every day. It says right here it's the first time that he did that. He goes from the wheelchair to the table. He has never unbuckled himself before. Right, but that's, that's what I'm saying, though. Is so, But how you made it sound was that he did that every day. And if you would, to, please, uh, uh, Ms. Okay. Rosario, if you would talk to the oh, chair. Sorry. If there's a question that you may have sorry. for us, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Let, let's refocus the room, please. And okay. uh, your, your question, please. Um, yeah, two things. Um, when you went back to Mr. Garvey being able to take vacation, <coughs> um, I actually since we were not able to ask questions at the town hall meeting to Mr. Hardy, um, I asked Mr. Hawks, and he assured me that he would get back to me the next day with an answer as to why Mr. Garvey was able to take vacation that week. He would speak Mr. Hardy. He told me it was a very valid question. I have since emailed him twice, and I still have not got a response back from Mr. Hawks as to why he was able to take that week. And then also, the district also has not done to, they want the parents to be involved in their kids' education. Um, they've not put out the testing schedules for days to make sure that the kids have their computers. I mean, I asked my daughter when she has it, so that I make sure that her computer is charged and ready since they have to use the computer that they have. We've never got anything brought home from General Johnny, and I believe the high school has, does not have things sent home current to say, this class is taking this test today. So. That just adds on to them. The testing is not as an important part of the year to them, where if it was an important part of the year, they would get that type of information out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm back again. As I was sitting back there, I got to thinking a little bit. Um, and based on the levy, the renewal levy coming up, I have some concerns. And, I, and, and as Josh pointed out, the timeline there's a big urgency here. You know, we're talking about $3.1 million. Mm -hmm. We can't wait until August 1st to make this decision. And, you know, I want to commend you folks, by the way, for standing tough last year, because a lot of people called for you to put a levy on blind, because they felt that it's money, you better get it for the kids, there's no other thing. And I think is, I was concerned, I think you guys were concerned, the CEO never came to a meeting, never talked to you folks. I mean, me personally, I would have been here the first meeting, said, I'm here, we've got to work together. He didn't choose to do that. I completely understand why you were cautious about putting that levy on, and I commend you for not putting it on, all right? But by not putting it on, you might have provided a, a positive note for this district, and you might hold a little more power than you think. You know, as I thought about this, <clears throat> you're taking all the brunt of putting the levy on. I think it's time you put that on the shoulders of the people that make a decision here. I, th I don't believe there will be a chance of this passing if Dave Hardy is still here. Uh, after talking to the community, I mean, even if you put it on, there's no chance anymore. All right? So I might uh, ask you to consider making a resolution that says that you'll be willing to put that levy on. I got to thinking about this, by the way, because part of the letter to the teachers gave them a, a deadline to resign if they don't want any of this action to follow them for those non-renewed teachers. Mm -hmm. 
It might not be a bad idea to make a resolution, putting a deadline of Dave Hardy either resigning, being removed by the Academic D Distress Commission, or possibly Paulo DiMario, and taking the pressure off you folks. It's their decision. And uh, so for your consideration, I, you know, and you have to consider the deadlines. I just realized that we're only two months out. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna do something like that, there has to be deadlines and pieces. You know, and I don't really believe that Dave Hardy is a $3.1 million man, <laughs> because that's what you're gonna be missing. And that's going to go on for is a five-year levy? It's a renewal. Seven renewal, years. and it would be seven five years. years. Seven, seven years. Seven years. Seven years. So $20, $20 million, because, you know, putting a new levy on is much more difficult than getting a renewal passed. So I just, uh, for your consideration, as I was sitting there realizing the timeline, a lot of people in Columbus believe, oh, we can wait and wait and wait. And we don't have the time. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Any, any more from the public? Have anything from any of our distress commissioners? You guys? You all clear? I think we said enough. <laughs> We're looking forward to attending the academic banquet yes. this evening. Yes, we are all I'm, going I'm to hungry. the academic yes. banquet. <laughs> yes. Uh, we do not have an executive session. Announcement when is our next board meeting? May 14th. May 14th. Um, also, there's going to be a group of us going down to talk to the State Board of Education and all of their board members on um, the 14th of this month. It'll be after lunch, so it'll be around one o'clock. And the State Board really don't know what's going on here. A lot of them are still saying, oh, we hear everything is fine in Lorraine, which is, uh, they gotta be living under a rock to think that everything is fine in Lorraine. But we're taking that opportunity to A, express what is really going on here, and B, to talk about what our plan can be coming out of the academic distress, no matter who's, who's at the helm. So. I recommend anybody who's willing to come, we need all the voices from all three of these communities that have been taken over by this House Bill 70 to really express how they feel about the politics of House Bill 70 without all the personalities, but just what it has done to our communities as a whole. Did you have something additional? Same thing, but it's, yes. We're gonna try, buddy. We're gonna, we're gonna be moving fast. Um, Let me know if we gotta switch it. You said it won't count. Yeah. Yes, that's a consideration. Yeah, just, just so you're not rushing. I didn't get can, can we go out to the next Tuesday then? Sure. Is that graduation day? Yeah. Yes. The 21st. Yeah. 21st. Oh, okay. These Tuesdays, these Tuesdays are not working out. Anyway, so why not put it on? Uh, <laughs> we can do it any day. Ex any explain day. That to, to me again tonight. that you're going to try to get down there May 14th in the morning by one o'clock. And still make a board meeting here. Well, that's what we're I talking think that's about. what we're discussing now. Oh, that's what you're doing now. Yeah, All right now. Yes. So we will come up with the best dates that are possible, and then we will make that publicly known on the date we're going to reschedule because it's important. And the state superintendent has stated that he's excited to hear what our plan could be coming out. Therefore, I think it's important that we go. In, at, at, at least indulge his excitement. How about that? <laughs> and I, I like to add that the state superintendent is a little leery because uh, his job is getting a little shaky, also. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Another question from the floor. Yes. Are we not able to get a bus? So I, a bus I, load of people I think that would be great. I I'm not the guy to lead that, but we need I as many. I know East Cleveland and Youngstown are trying to get there as well, but the more people we can take from Lorraine just to... Why don't you start advertising it and I'll get the price and we'll get it taken care of. We'll have a bus. So everybody who's watching, we'll have a bus. See Bambi, she's going to get it all orchestrated. And um, we're going down to... And while we're there, we'll see some of our other legislators. We'll try to make sure we can make a whole day of it. That'd be good? Need a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Support. Second. Roll call. Mr. Demacchia? Yep. Mr. Sturgill? Yes. Mr. Ballard? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Thank you all for coming. This has been a production of Lorraine City Schools TV20 WLCS.